Rocky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This out of the video. Today I'm here with Gil Goring and Dave Isles to talk about the Hockey Arena Fire. Thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. Um, so to start, can you tell me a little bit about yourselves? Um, How long have you been here? 78 years. Native of Native Clintonian. Uh, when well, we'll get into your questions later on, but uh, born and raised in the arena, I never skated in the outdoor rink. But I started it when they put it inside where it was a little warmer. Very good. Well, I'm a Native Clintonian also. I own seventy six years. Uh, spent 30 years away while I was in the Air Force and then came back and settled here. I did skate on the outdoor rink and I can remember the first time I was able to skate across the ice without <laughs> falling down. So, and of course I remember the old rink and the, and the new rink. Very good. Alright, so let's talk about the fire. What year did the fire happen in? September 11th, 1953. I looked that up before I came here. So. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what day of the week that was? It was Friday. a Friday. A Friday. All right. Very good. You, you won't find many older Clintonians that don't remember that day. No. Well, it, that's right. And Everybody if they do, then, then they're persona non grata. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And um, so you guys both skated at the arena then, correct? Mm-hmm. Right. How often did you go skating there? As often as they had public skating. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember how often they had public skating? I would. Uh, Thursday afternoons they had a, a pickup hockey arrangement where, you know, they just went out and played. Okay. Um, Saturday afternoon and Sunday they had public skating. Very nice. Uh, the rest of the time it was hockey, figure skating, other things. Was that it was a, that was a social hub of the universe, by the way. Down there. Okay. That was the place to be. You, you were nothing if you weren't at the arena. Very good. Uh, that's probably not a good thing to say, is it? <laughs> right. We're very big about the hockey. No, it's um, yeah. the arena was uh, everywhere he was there. Yeah. Um, so, how did you hear about the fire? Yeah. Well, I was I was sitting at breakfast. Okay. Uh, my house was four or five houses up the street from the arena. My father was an officer in the fire department, I think a first or a second assistant chief. And at that time, when the fire horn went off, we didn't have pagers or radio, so the operator would call the officers. So the horn went off, the phone went off. I can still see my father. He went up, he picked up the phone, he just listened. And you may want to record this or not, but his, the actual quote was, oh shit. <laughs> and at that time, we knew it was the arena. We could look out the back window, and it was just going at that point. And was that the same location that the arena's at now, the new mm-hmm. arena? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And what about you, Dave? We lived on Utica Street, right next to where Burdick's Monument Works is now. Okay. We heard the fire whistle go off, and for some reason, I don't know why, but I looked out the front window and saw black smoke. And on the corner of Taylor Ave and McBride used to be a coal storage unit facility. And my first thought was, Richards is on fire. And so when we went to school that morning, we went down Taylor Ave and across Shenango Ave. And when we got down there, I thought, well, this is not burning. And then I discovered it was the arena and that would have preferred it was Britchers. <laughs> Especially if that's where all the kids wanted to be at. Yes. So did you not find out that's oh, what it God. was? When um, you got to when, school that day? When we actually, well, no, I, I walked by it on the way to okay. school. Okay, okay. And they were fighting the fire then. Mm-hmm. It was pretty much gone by then, but... I'm so it, it, sorry. It was, it was an aluminum structure. Okay. Yeah, uh, and... It just heated up, and that aluminum literally melted. Right down. Some panels even flew up into the air, and they found it up, panel up on Skyline Drive. It just it several from, miles away. Yeah. The yeah. heat made it rise, and then it just floated in the wind. And you could see, you could see, 
globs of melted aluminum down here the next oh, day. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Did you guys stop on your way to school? Did you stop for a bit to watch? It was tears in my eyes. To do? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think there was any kid in the village that didn't really feel this thing. Yeah. And were there a lot of other kids there going by the time you had arrived? Anybody that lived in that, that end of town? Yes, if they were in that area because they were on their way to school, yes, they were, they were standing the there watching it. The school, the school wasn't uh, very receptive to our being late. No? I remember one of the girls in our class, uh, Sandy Gregory, lived the yeah. house is like this far away from the arena. Okay. And she was worried about her house burning down. Yeah. I was in seventh grade and and Sandy came late to school and Gert Welch was all over her. Oh, oh dear. I, I, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> but. I know Gert Welch. Oh boy. That's, that's going to be very hard for a child to be at school wondering if their house is safe. Yeah, and then well, on top of it, their favorite place is the, the, gone. The amazing part about that fire was it never touched any of the houses that were so close to it yeah. on McBride Ave. Which I think probably was a, a good save for the fire. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. they're all so close along there, it could have wiped out the whole block. Mm -hmm. oh, that's good that and one of them was a gas station. Yeah, oh boy, right. which would have been a bigger issue. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. And um, so, you know, your father responded. How did your parents react, Dave? Uh, at the time, my father was on the board of directors. And uh, by Sunday morning, he and Ed Stanley were on their way to Canada mm -hmm. to get some plans for a new building. Okay. I so mean, that's... Quick that, action. That's how quickly this... By Sunday afternoon, you would never have known there was a fire there. Yeah. It had been cleaned up so well, so quickly. Everybody in the in the village yeah. was down there Saturday morning helping. Helping out. out. Yeah. If you weren't all dirty and sooty, you were covered head trouble. to toe. Yeah. yeah, you were going to be an outcast because you you had to have worked on that cleanup. Definitely. And we had we had ice to skate on in January. <laughs> okay. That that year, I mean that. That's a miracle for him to come. Yeah, that's very the, the fast old, turnaround. The only part of that building that didn't burn was the ice making machinery that are wow. that's in the back, and that was only saved because the ice making machinery had been put in a year or two after the first arena was built, and it was in a cement block building, not a Quonset hut type thing. Yeah, so it kind of saved itself. So it had its own little firewall between the main arena and the and the uh, ice equipment. Very good. Okay. And how long, so it cleaned up pretty fast, but how long were you guys out there cleaning up with everybody? All day Saturday. All day All Saturday, Saturday. Saturday. Most of the day Sunday. Yeah. The town just kind of came together and took care oh, of it. Yeah. It was phenomenal. That's we, amazing. We had, <clears throat> we had piles of aluminum in one place, piles of pipe in another place. Um, you had to pull down part of a wall that was only part, but was still standing. And they would put a rope on there and there was 20 kids pulling on had to pull it over. Uh, it, it was just a, And there was miles and miles of pipe to pull, pull up. Mm -hmm. They say there's 10 miles of pipe underneath the floor of that building, or of that mm -hmm. surface, but I don't know that that's a fact. I just, that's a, a figure I've heard. It sounds pretty accurate, though. You know, well, what, they, what, they, what, they cut it in 20-foot sections, and then about 15 kids would grab a hold of each section. And at that time, there was a ditch along the side of the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they'd carry it down into that ditch and up the other side and wow. put it off in the pile somewhere. Okay. You know, one of the legends, and I, I think this is pretty accurate, that the night before, there was a wrestling match there. And, and it was a completely wooden structure, so I don't know if they ever established what started it, probably a cigarette, or because you could smoke inside at that mm, time. Yeah. But there was a, a roustabout who was asleep, probably. Asleep, on the mat. On the mat, in the ring, in the center of, that, of the arena. And you know what woke him up? The fire horn. And he woke up and it was a blaze wow. all around. And he got out alive. He, he had just fallen asleep on the mat. Well, he was probably passed out. Somewhere there is a picture of him sitting in front of what's now Hale's bus garage 
with a blanket around him. Yeah. But I haven't seen it in years, but wow. I, I have seen that picture. That's very fortunate. Oh, yeah. He was a lucky individual. Yeah, because at the, the nick of time, the, when he was... woke up, it was an inferno. I think he would have been woken up from all the heat. Mm -hmm. It's a wonder he didn't die right there. So they don't know what actually caused the fire then? Never came no. up with a conclusion. No. no. The theory was a cigarette. Well, it was, just, it was just such a conflagration that I don't know how they could have ever established it. And it just kind of engulfed itself. Into it. Wow. Very good. Um, so how many fire companies responded? Do you remember? Well, every, everybody around Hartford, uh, I think even Utica sent up. Uh, some aerials because I'm not sure we had a, a ladder truck at the time. You had a ladder truck, but no yeah, aerial. No aerial, and and uh, at that, you know, when you have a big fire like that, Dad got on the radio and, and they just called for help from everybody around. Whoever will so, respond. Yeah. How long did the fire, the flames last? Mm, not not very long. No, it, went, it went pretty quick. Yeah, the, a, the whole superstructure was wood mm -hmm. with just this little thin coating of aluminum. It, I heard one time that it was the largest Quonset hut in the in the country. Uh, it was huge. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually it's a little bit bigger than the building that they, that's there now. Okay, that's interesting. Um, but once it got started, it it just went poof. It was a good bonfire. Blame. Forgot our marshmallows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so once you guys had cleaned up, what can you describe what it looked like once the cleanup was all done and flat, just a big empty space? Yeah, just room to, the room only to thing, start building. The only thing that was left were underneath the floor. There are concrete strips that they laid the pipes on, um, and you could see the the outline of the dasher boards and these strips crossways of the rink that supported the, the pipes. The block room where the refrigeration was. Yeah, yes, and that's so all standard. there was left. Wow, wow. And um, so how long did the, the town smell like fire after that? Why would Smell imagine? like fire? Yeah. I don't know. No, I don't recall it smelling no, like fire. No, you don't? No, wow. I don't think there was a lot of wind, I don't recall. Okay. It pretty well went straight up. Straight up and out. Yeah, yeah, a nice fall day slit. for a fire. <laughs> <laughs> and um, do you remember any of the media coverage of the fire and the aftermath of oh, the fire? Oh, there was a lot of a it. A lot of yeah. it. And a lot of media coverage on the construction of the new ring. Okay. We, have, we have, should have a recording of the dedication of the new ring here. I, I got it from WIBX because my grandfather was the mayor of the village at the time. And and I, I sent it up here somewhere in our archives here. If you've got it. If you can't find it, let me know. I will. Yeah. So your grandfather was the mayor, and then your yeah. father worked for the police department. Uh, fire, fire department. Fire department. Yeah. Um, so what was your grandfather's take? I mean, being the mayor. Well, to you'd have to know my grandfather. He was town. a man of very few words. I probably, I probably heard him. He made a little speech at the dedication of the new arena. I, that was the longest sentence I ever heard him make. Have you knew my grandfather a little bit? I remember him vaguely. Yeah. yeah. Just a very quiet man. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, and so once the cleanup was done, what was the, how did the construction phase go? Did you guys help with it? Did the town help or people um, come in to build it? It was built by H.R. Beebe. The owner of H.R. Beebe, I okay. believe, was Phil Miller. Yeah. Takes me a minute now. It's all right. It's 78 <laughs> years here. You're doing great. Um, they laid the cornerstone right away. The, the, the cornerstone was laid pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, there were local contractors working on it. And Stan Germond. But most of the, yeah, Stan Germond, uh, Gordon Talbot worked on it. Uh, Ed Schwald worked on some of the electric, um, but mostly it was HRBB. And how long did you say the construction took? Mm, we skated in De in January. It wasn't done then, but they were. But, but the building wasn't finished. Okay, but it was but, but skatable. Ed wanted it open for 
the kids. I imagine you guys were all itching to get back in well, there. We played, I was playing peewee hockey at the time, and, and we, we could play in there. Yeah. Do you remember the first time that you guys were able to go back in and play? I did. I remember it because they were running the, uh, what they call salamanders, mm -hmm. the, the real uh, heaters that are run on oil. Yeah. And there was terrible smell in there. It's one of the things to kill us all because they were trying to keep yeah. it warm so the blocks could, could cure it from the concrete. But we survived. <laughs> you lived to tell the tale. And now, well, I don't need to get into that. Go ahead. Um, so, do you know if anybody took any souvenirs from the old building? Do you guys remember collecting anything as you walked by that day? No? Only, only the. Somebody's probably got a glob of, of aluminum, aluminum somewhere. somewhere. Right? They might have, they got some great pictures down in the uh, firehouse number two down at Franklin Springs. Okay, I'll have to check that out sometime. Very my, good. my dad was in there very shortly after they allowed anybody in and, and took the plaque that's upstairs. Oh. Okay. I did not know that. I looked at that plaque though. Yeah, he grabbed that first thing because he didn't want it to disappear and be sold for bronze. No. And yeah. now it's here. Good. It's now here. Very good. Um, so what did your parents do to help with the recovery? Um, did they help, you know, fund it, anything like that? Fundraisers? My mother and uh, Mabel Maloney and a couple other women uh, raffled off a 1950 or 51 Mercury. They were all over Central New York at county fairs and various episodes selling raffle tickets on this thing. I, that was one of their big fundraisers, was this car that they raffled off. It, it was not a, a town of Kirkland building at the time, it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a really, a, I don't know, private structure, I guess you'd say. It was now, all did it they was, sell bonds? I know they sold bonds for the yeah, first Yeah, there are some upstairs. Yeah. Um, they sold them in hundred and five hundred and I think thousand dollar denominations, and they started out selling like hotcakes, and then as they were, they had to sell one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth, which was back then was a lot of money. Uh, they had trouble selling them toward the end, and okay. probably it was a good thing they did because they gave them this, some of these things bonds to creditors and payment of their for work that was mm -hmm. done. All right. Um, and during the construction, did you guys do outdoor hockey in replace of um, your indoor hockey rink at all? Oh, no. I don't think, I don't, I don't remember playing outdoors. I don't know. There, was, there wasn't anybody, any place to play. The, yeah. Well, the, 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 the outdoor rink was gone. We did have Sage Rink up at Hamilton College. So um, they, the Comets played up there. Yeah. That's where they were when um, they were displaced from the arena? Yes. Okay. Because they, they started their year late in October, mm -hmm. and I don't believe they ever missed a game, but, but the college was very cooperative about letting them play up there Saturday nights. Very good. Did you guys go to games up there? I yeah, didn't. I, I don't think I did. No? It was a very cold arena. Coldest arena? It would be 10 degrees colder inside than out oh, no. in that building. And <laughs> literally, people would go outside between periods to warm up. Wow. <laughs> it, All was right. it was awful. It was Sage Rink was designed to be a refrigerator. They didn't have artificial ice making, so they had louvers at the end. Mm -hmm. And they would open it at night and capture the cold air and then close it during the day and keep that cold air. That's oh, how wow. they kept ice in there. I did not know that. That's interesting. Yeah. But unfortunate for all the fans that had to freeze <laughs> while they're in there. Um, do you remember when the Comets were able to go back to their home arena? Oh, shortly after it opened, yes. yes. Um, they, I would say probably in January. I would over. guess by the end of January they were taking fans back into the building. Okay, was that a big, was there a big celebration for them returning back to their home? Anything uh, I like don't that? recall I don't one. No. no. No, just it was just a normal thing to do to get back into your own building. Get yeah. back in and start going at it again. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, what improvements did you see with the new rink compared to, if you could compare the old rink to the new one? It was more fireproof. <laughs> that was the first the thing that came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, it was bigger. Mm -hmm. yeah, the new one was bigger than the old one. Okay. Um, as far as improvements, the building never did get it done. It, is, it isn't finished to this day. No. The upstairs lobby is supposed to have a skim coat of concrete on it about that thick. And they just ran out of money, and that was one of the things that never got done. You don't notice it so much anymore because it's got 60 years of paint on it now, and the crevices are all filled in. Mm -hmm. It showed a lot. The old doors that used to be on there were about that far off the floor okay. because they had made them for an old, for a two inch allowance underneath. Yeah. The dressing rooms were a little bit better. They, the new arena had the dressing rooms on the end towards Kirkland Ave. The old arena had the dressing room sort of on a lean-to on the side. Right. And you went in, there was a snack bar, and then they had rooms as you went down the hall. Okay. They were nothing to brag about, though. <laughs> and do you remember any special events that you guys had once the arena opened for the children? Was there, um, I mean, I know that there was regular open skate, but did they do anything special to get the kids back in there? I don't think they had to do anything no, special at that point ready. because they were so anxious to get back in there. Yeah. How busy was it when it first opened back up? Uh, pretty busy. It, it picked up just like the old yep. one. Yeah. Very good. From September to January, four months, all that entire four months, all the kids could think about is getting back to the rink. Getting back into skating. Yeah. And it was no big deal to get them back in the building. A lot of romances were started and stopped there. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine so. There are, there are couples in this town today that met at yeah, the arena, right. and yeah. they're still together. Yeah. That's so special, especially now that it's, I mean, it's still there, and they can go back and visit, and very nice. They raise their kids and in, the, in the same building. Yeah, yeah. Diehard hockey fans. And how was Pee Wee Hockey when you guys returned? Oh, it, it went well. I, I was playing Pee Wee Hockey, let's see, if I was 12 then, and we were winning state championships at that okay. at that point. Okay. We won, in our class, uh, we won two state championships in a row and went to the nationals twice. Very nice. Um, and there was the dedication. Can you tell me a little bit about the dedication of the new ring? Well, as I say, it was recorded. Um, I remember... Mayor, Mayor Boyd Golder from Utica was there, and Stan Germain and Ed Stanley, and probably the construction. Len, Len Wilbur. Len Wilbur from WIBX, and, and my grandfather because he was the mayor. Yeah. Um, and they all they all said a few words. And it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a big deal. I was going to say it, it was a pretty low key yeah. uh, event, okay. and it was held right outside the front of the arena where they. They laid the, the cornerstone, or whatever you want to call it, yeah. uh, at that ceremony, and it was kind of neat. Very good. Um, so let's talk about when you go there and go skating. Did they have um, a concession stand or concession mm -hmm. of any type? What yeah. was your favorite snack to get? Oh, Lordy. We yeah. never had any money to buy <laughs> snacks. Oh, huh? popcorn and <laughs> soda pop. So they didn't have skate rental. Did they? How much was skate rental? Oh, quite a few. And, and I had, I when I was in high school, I used to work for Mrs. Sherman, who owned the skate rental, and, and I would rent the skates there. I could okay. keep my hockey equipment in there when I was playing on the high school team, so that was one of the benefits of that. I remember, though, one Friday night, <coughs> when people rent skates, mm -hmm. they would leave their shoes. Yep. And then you bring the skates back and get your shoes back. All the skates were in, one shoe left. Ten below zero. <laughs> I have no idea. No idea how that happened or how you do that. Oh my goodness. Maybe they got carried home that night. Yeah. Very good. And when you would go um, skating, did you, you know, get all bundled up or you just, because no, it, it was the new rink, it was just comfortable? I don't recall it being cold. No, no. Number one, there was no wind. Mm -hmm. and. That helps a lot. And number two, you're skating all over the place. Yeah. yeah. You're all over the place. Yeah. Raising a sweat. You only so. took your mitten off if you were skating with Holding your hands with somebody. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I was not holding hands with him, by the way. I no. <laughs> Very good. I personally cannot skate. I hold onto the railing and hold all the way around, and it's a terrible sight. 
<laughs> I wish I could skate though. Very right. much too. Um, so, is there any other stories that you, any memories specific to the fire, the new arena that you want to share before we end? I can't think of any that you was, haven't covered pretty well. It was uh, certainly the happening of, of the fall of 1953. Uh, that anybody that lived in the village would, would remember that. Okay. Do you think that it went out as far as you know, kids in New Hartford were affected, um, kids in Utica? Did oh, yeah. those yeah, children because come into town to skate in town? Not so much then. Okay. Uh, probably as there is now because transportation wasn't as good yeah. as it was it is now. So That's true. Parents didn't throw them in the car and drive them 10 or 15 miles. It was, you can't walk there, you're in trouble, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you guys for sitting down and chatting about this. Oh, it's yeah. fun. Yes. For the uh, refrigeration, it's a, they have a, a lot of ammonia, mm -hmm. and it was leaking. And one of the firemen went in and didn't have his mask. They didn't wear a lot of masks at that time. He went in and it put him right down. They dragged oh, no. him out of there, and he was all right. But they got him out of there right away. So. Is that thing on? Okay. <laughs> um, now that I think about it, do they still use the same, the blockhouse in the concrete? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, still there. Still there. Still used yeah. very good. New equipment, but yeah. same building. Same concrete. Right. Yes. So it's kind of like you can go there and experience some of the old arena. It's still um, kind of there. Pictures yeah. on the wall is about the only thing. Yeah. You, you're not going to believe this, but I wander through that building periodically. Mm -hmm. because I spent so much time there. As a kid, I skated there. As an adult, I was on the board of directors for 30 or 35 years, and I still stop in and see Mike Orsino and ask him about how, what's going on, and, yeah. you know, it's none of my business anymore. I just care about the life. building. It, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a... It was a home away from home from yeah, a lot right. of Clinton kids. Definitely. And it gave an identity to the village, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. And, you know, this hockey 100-year thing is going to be very interesting, but that, that arena, like like Dave said, was just the hub of the universe for us. The center of Clinton. Yeah. Very nice. Well, thank you for sharing.